Good afternoon. My name is Tom Beaker, and I'd like to welcome you to the Nebraska State Historical Society's Brown Bag Lecture Series held here at the Nebraska History Museum on the third Thursday of each month. A detailed schedule of this series, as well as information on all historical society activities and programs, can be found at our website, www.nebraskahistory.org. Before I introduce today's speaker, I would like to thank the Nebraska State Historical Society Foundation for funding for the filming of these lectures. Their financial support allows us to tape and broadcast these programs on public access television. Today's speaker is Lance Todd, the manager of the Lester F. Larson Tractor Museum on the University of Nebraska <laughs> East Campus. Mr. Todd is a native of Eagle and a 2008 graduate, pardon me, 2004 graduate, eight or four? Eight. Eight of Doan College. Lance will talk today on the history of Nebraska's tractor, tractor test laws and current testing practices and also about their tractor collection. Lance. All right, thanks, Tom. Um, as he mentioned, I'm the manager of the Lester Larson Tractor Test and Power Museum at uh, the University of Nebraska East Campus. And um, we'll have some more information at the end of that on where we're located and, and our hours and such. But um, I started um, at the museum in June, so uh, I'll try and get most of my facts straight um, and we'll, we'll kind of get through this uh, together. But uh, Anyway, um, as he mentioned, I'm, uh, I've been working in the museum industry for eight years, and I um, uh, graduated from Doan College in 2008 and graduated from Waverly High School in 2004. Um, so, what I want to talk first about is, <clears throat> excuse me, is Nebraska's test law. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that Nebraska has a test law or, um, or when it came about. So that's kind of where we'll start. First off, um, <coughs> Wilmot Crozier, um, pictured here with his wife, um, was a farmer from Osceola, Nebraska, and he purchased a Minneapolis Ford tractor, um, one of which we have in the collection. Uh, the Minneapolis Ford was not associated with the Ford Motor Company whatsoever. What had happened is um, Mr. Ewing, who owned the company, uh, wanted to basically pawn off of Henry Ford's name and the Model T at the time. And so he hired a young carpenter whose last name was Ford and made him the tractor designer, and they called it the Ford Tractor Company. And um, in any event, it became the Minneapolis Ford. Um, Wilmot Crozier purchased uh, this tractor, as I mentioned, brought it home to Osceola, and it was awful. It didn't do anything that uh, it was advertised to do, um, wouldn't uh, perform in the field like it was supposed to. So he complained to the company like any good consumer would. Um, he ended up receiving a second tractor from uh, the Ford Tractor Company, and obviously it too had the same problems. Um, so he ended up purchasing a used uh, bull tractor which was very similar in design to the Minneapolis Ford and it also didn't perform uh, in the field. So he finally got fed up and he bought a used uh, Rumley oil pole which is uh, pictured here in the, uh, on, the, on the screen. And um, he purchased this tractor and it was advertised that it would pull three plows in the field. It was actually um, Wilmot could get it to pull five so it outperformed uh, his expectations and he got to thinking well you know why can't all these tractors perform at the same level as the Rumley oil pole or why shouldn't they all be held to the same standard so in 1919 um, Crozier ran for legislature and uh, he ended up um, being elected, and his very first bill that he put together was the Nebraska Test Law for 1919. <clears throat> March 13, 1919, the uh, test law was passed, and it becomes a law. Um, 
and I'll go into the law in a little bit uh, better detail here in a second. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, July 15th, 1919, uh, the University of Nebraska uh, Ag Engineering Program uh, creates the, the Nebraska Test Lab um, in which all tests are to be performed, and that was a stipulation that was in the law. Um, L.W. Chase, who anybody familiar with the University of Nebraska, um, the name might be familiar. L.W. Chase was the head of the Ag Engineering Department and so he had it written into the law that all the testing has to be done by the Ag Engineering Department, um, which is uh, still the department we use today uh, for the testing. Um, Chase Hall is uh, located uh, at the end of Ag Mall on East Campus. And he hired uh, Claude Shedd, who was an engineer from Iowa State and he became the first chief engineer of the Nebraska Test Lab. And his job was simply to figure out how to create tests, what they were gonna be testing, um, how to make the playing field equal for uh, all the tractors and all the manufacturers. On April 9th, 1920, the very first tractor was certified. It was not the first tractor to be tested, but it was the first tractor to pass all the tests and the first to become certified. Uh, the tractor, let's see if I have it here, yeah. The, the tractor was a Waterloo Boy uh, Model N uh, 1225, um, and it was um, advertised as a 1225, so its a drawbar uh, pulling power uh, was supposed to be at 12 horsepower, and it actually performed it at a little over 15 horsepower. And the belt uh, drive was uh, advertised at 25, and it performed right at 25 horsepower. So um, it was the very first tractor to be um, tested and certified. Um, going back to the, the test law, uh, the test law simply states, without getting into a bunch of uh, legal jargon, that every uh, tractor that is sold in the state of Nebraska through a dealership <coughs> has to be certified through the University of Nebraska's test facility. And that test facility, again, is um, located on East Campus. And the museum is currently the original building that was built in 1920 as the test lab. Um, that building, we, we joke around the museum um, that it, it was built as a temporary building, but here we are in 2012 and it's still standing strong. So, um, but, uh, Anyway, it was built in 1920 to house all the tests. And um, along with the test law, um, it also stated not only do you have to be certified, but you also have to have either a dealership or a parts facility um, within one to two shipping days of where the tractor is being sold. Uh, so if you're selling a tractor in Lincoln, Nebraska, you have to have a dealership in or around uh, the Lincoln area in order to service these tractors for the farmers. So if they break down in the field, the farmer's not sitting there for a month or two months um, and waiting for parts. Uh, it was also common at that time, as in many manufacturers, for the con man to come out um, in a lot of these uh, manufacturing businesses. Um, the uh, Ewing, who owned uh, Minneapolis Ford, would um, routinely ask for a $75 down posit, or deposit and um, you wouldn't see a tractor. And so uh, that's just kind of the practices that not only his company were, were doing, but several companies at the time. And you'd get these fly-by-night um, companies that would put together a, a really shoddy tractor and sell three or four of them, and then they'd move on to a different business venture. They were just getting their quick money, and they didn't have any parts being manufactured to service these tractors. And so. It really was a, a law that was passed in order to protect the Nebraska farmer. And um, that law, going through this presentation, um, you'll see in a minute, uh, that law is still in effect today. And we still do tests. In fact, they're testing John Deere's now. Um, but they still um, have to be certified. And obviously, in today's, uh, in today's manufacturing, today's shipping uh, industries and things, you, you can sell a tractor on the East Coast and still have a, a 
uh, manufacturing facility on the West Coast and still be able to provide parts to that person within one to two days. Um, so the shipping aspect of it isn't really that big of a factor, but uh, the fact of the matter is that the tractors still have to be certified through the University of Nebraska's test facility, which is a worldwide um, known institution um, and we're the only test facility in uh, North America. In fact, there are only two test facilities that are known throughout the world, and one, the other one is in Europe. Um, and so it's uh, not only is it a, uh, a major part for Nebraska farmers, but it's also a major part for all farmers in the United States purchasing tractors uh, to kind of have that peace of mind. So what are we testing when we're testing tractors? Um, there's actually uh, four or five tests that they do today. Originally, the tests that were done are drawbar horsepower, which drawbar horsepower is basically just your horsepower, um, your pulling power, how much horsepower you have when you're pulling a plow or a, a planter or um, any other implement that you may uh, pull. Um, the second test that was done is the belt horsepower. Um, now, obviously, when this first started out, all the tractors had belts. Um, they didn't have uh, power takeoff shafts that we have today that come out of the back of the tractor. So um, they did belt testing, and you'll see some pictures here in a minute uh, of what that looks like. Um, but today we do PTO testing where the tractor is, is hooked up to the dyno um, that way. They also do a hydraulics test. Um, making sure that all the hydraulics work properly. Um, if they have uh, any implement lifts, that's tested also um, so that everything can, can be certified. And um, they also do a sound test. Um, so they'll, after they're done uh, pulling the, the test cars and whatnot, they will um, basically just go at various speeds around the track for a set number of uh, passes past the um, telemetry point in order to receive sound levels uh, to make sure that they're, they don't exceed any of the sound levels that were put forth by the, the federal government um, in order to pass that. So I have a series of early testing photos and I'll kind of talk through what's, what's going on here. Um, first of all, the, the big uh, smokestack in the background, uh, anybody familiar with East Campus in Lincoln knows that that is still there today. That is one of the few buildings um, that is older than our building on campus. And um, throughout all these pictures, that'll be the, the one constant. And uh, through, through some of the aerial photos, you can see some changes as well. But um, this is a really early test. Um, our building is just off to the right, you can kind of see the three windows there. Um, that's our building, and those uh, windows and the building configuration as a whole is still exactly the same as it was in 1920. The, uh, the first tractor, the, basically the Caterpillar um, tracked vehicle, is the one being tested. Uh, the car immediately behind it is the test car. Um, that test car obviously at this time wasn't as elaborate as it is today and we'll see some photos of that as well. Um, but they, they did have all the instrumentation that they needed for the testing on that test car. Each tractor uh, back behind it is what we call a load car or a load vehicle. Those tractors are basically just dead weight and they're um, basically dragging the tractor down into a uh, uh, a category of horsepower that can be tested um, and then they can also see how many uh, they can also go as far as they can to exceed that as well. Um, some of today's tractors uh, are incredibly powerful and have sometimes four, five, six large tractors back behind them and so um, you'll see that throughout these photos too. You'll also note it's kind of hard to see in, in these photos but the, the third um, tractor back there has skis on the back wheels um, because it's a steam-powered vehicle, so you, you wouldn't be able, it wouldn't be able to provide great load, but it's incredibly heavy. So instead of um, letting it turn the motor over, it, uh, they're basically just dragging it on the skis. And at this time, um, you can see that the track was dirt. And I'll kind of go back through that here in a little bit. 
um, and you'll kind of see the evolution of the test track uh, as we go forward. Um, I should also note that the test cars, um, by today's standards, are basically, um, they're, the engines are turning over, um, but, they're, but they're basically compressing the exhaust to create different loads. Um, so you can have an incredibly heavy uh, tractor being the uh, load car, but then you can compress its engine completely down to where it just barely creeps along um, in order to provide um, extra load for the, uh, for the tractor being tested. Um, but back in these days, they mostly just drug them as dead weight. Uh, so here's, here's a photo. This would have been taken um, probably late 30s, early 40s. Again, we have the tractor in front being tested on a dirt track. Um, and that was the first major um, load, or uh, excuse me, test car that was uh, manufactured by the university. That's an all aluminum bodied um, test vehicle that they used um, up till, I think they used it in this configuration up through the 50s. Um, then they finally uh, permanently attached it to an Oliver tractor um, in order to create more load because as, as you can uh, as you can imagine, that, that test vehicle itself do, isn't, doesn't weigh a whole lot. Um, so in order to cut down on the amount of load cars that they need behind it, they would um, put, um, they attached it to a, a permanent tractor so that it kind of had its own weight um, by itself. And then, of course, the, the tractor back behind it is just being the, uh, the load vehicle as well. So here's basically the same angle as that first, uh, that first photo. Again, you can see the, the power plant back there and then our facility on the right. Um, but here again, this is an Oliver being tested. This is test number 391 according to the photo, um, which again would have been uh, right around the early 40s. But uh, here again, you see the, the dirt track. And um, I have some notes here. Um, in a little bit that kind of talks about the history of the track itself. But um, the, uh, the instruments also on the uh, rear wheels of the tractor being tested, those are wheel counters. And we have those on display as well as many of the original test equipment um, that was used throughout the years, in including a dyno that dates back to the early 1900s, or uh, excuse me, not a dyno, a, um, a load cell. Uh, that would basically go between the, the test car and the tractor being tested that would determine its pulling power um, through springs um, and a series of instruments. But um, So those are wheel counters. It's a little bit of a far cry from what we have today, but it serves the same purpose. Here is a picture from the inside. Um, basically, all the testing is done outdoors except for the... Um, the belt horsepower, the PTO uh, horsepower, those are hooked up to a dyno which is inside the, uh, the test facility and um, that's how they're, they're done. But this particular vehicle, um, you can see the, the opening back there uh, on the top of the photo, that's actually our front door of the museum right now. That's where you come into the museum. And um, right now we have a, the dynamometer that was probably used at the same time as, as this um, photo was taken, sitting basically right uh, at that wall. But originally, as you can tell, the dyno was in the back room and the belt was run through the wall in order to uh, hook it up to the, to the dynamometer. Um, you also notice chains uh, down here at the front. Um, still in the museum today, we have large uh, hooks basically anchored in the uh, in the concrete that you can still see where those chains are uh, hooked up to in order to keep the the tractor um, stable in the uh, during the test and they you can't really see it here either but they would be hooked up backwards too so that the the vehicle couldn't move forwards or backwards but um, and then uh, the building or the the room on the right there with the window um, that was the fuel room, and I forgot to mention this when we were talking about testing, um, but the testing vehicle, the, the tractor being tested itself, does not carry any fuel. 
Uh, all the fuel is supplied by the test car. Um, back uh, in the early days, they would actually have a, a separate um, vehicle that would have the, the fuel on it. Um, today, we have the fuel right on the, uh, the, the test car. And the reason for that is so that basically as the tests go on, um, these tests uh, take eight to 10 hours generally being pulled around the track. And so as your fuel level goes down, your, your weight obviously of the, the tractor is gonna go down as well. And so this keeps everything on a level playing field. Um, as the weight of the tractor goes down, they apply more and more um, force to compensate that um, and they keep everything level. Uh, as it uh, as they they go through the testing, but um, the uh, the fuel being supplied for this particular vehicle is located in that room. That was the that was the fuel room, and they also have scales. Um, all the uh, uh, all the fuel is is scaled out um, so that they they can test uh, fuel economy too. Um, back back when they first started doing the testing. They measured that, but it usually wasn't that widely publish, published. Um, it would be in the report, but many of the manufacturers didn't see that as a marketability like we do today, where, um, where your fuel economy is, uh, needs to be better than the competitor, and some of that is a, a selling point for a lot of the companies. Um, so they would also test that um, as well. Um, along with, with uh, testing, when, when a, a company wants to submit a tractor for a test, they also provide um, all the advertisement materials. Um, a tractor can be sold prior to being tested um, if it applies for a, a temporary permit, basically, that um, if you apply for this temporary permit, it basically just says that you intend on having that tractor um, tested at our facility. And uh, so there's a lot of models by today's standards that are being sold that haven't necessarily been tested yet, but they, they will be tested. And obviously by today's standards as well, um, the manufacturing of this equipment is a lot more reliable than it used to be. So you don't have as many dangers buying a tractor that's being um, hasn't been certified yet it only applied for the temporary permit because you know that if nothing else the company is going to compensate you if, if there's any issues um, going on whereas back here uh, back when it started they didn't necessarily have that uh, that reliability um, for that so here are some pictures of modern testing obviously the tractors have changed fairly dramatically um, this particular John Deere, I, d I don't have the actual model on it. This was the, a similar tractor that was being tested when I left uh, this morning. But um, as you can tell, actually no, um, that is different. This one is, uh, has 12 wheels. And the one that was being tested when I left today had, um, had four wheels on each corner. So it was, uh, it was the next model up. But um, in any event, um, I have some more pictures coming up that'll kind of show this, but um, this is our uh, our test track now, and I'll talk a little bit about that here in a little bit. But um, this is, this was taken from the roof of our uh, our museum, and the track itself is basically located between our building and Thirty Third Street. If you drive down Thirty Third Street, you can kind of see the the embankment um, of the track and sometimes you can see the tractors going around particularly the larger ones but um, so this is what we have today and this is a, a tracked vehicle that's being tested um, back when they first started doing tracked vehicles when the track was dirt it wasn't a big deal um, once they paved the track which I'll talk about here in a little bit they um, ran they had a basically a dirt track around the outside of the concrete track to do these tracked vehicles because the tracks were, were steel at the time. Um, but now we have rubber tracked vehicles and so they can do those right on the track as well. Um, they generally lay down a lot more rubber um, on the track than the other vehicles based on the, the friction, but um, they can still do them adequately. Basically what we have here is the, the yellow vehicle, that is the test car, that's our new test car. And that was actually built by Caterpillar um, 
for the university for testing. They also built uh, a second one for their personal facility that they have uh, for their equipment as well. But basically what it does is it provides the load and it also provides the fuel to the tractor being tested. Um, two engineers can sit up in the cab and monitor all the telemetry and everything that's on board with, uh, with the test vehicle. Majority of the tractors that are tested will only require um, the test car as load um, and then also possibly one other load car behind it. Um, you won't necessarily see this many load cars. This one I think has three behind it. The one that was uh, out there this morning with the four wheels on each corner had, uh, had five load vehicles plus the test car. Um, so it, had, it was towing six vehicles in total. It looks like a little train going around there. But um, that's basically just a product of how much horsepower um, these tractors have. Would you need that much horsepower around here? That's up to the farmer. Um, that depends on what, what they're doing um, and you know, what their land looks like and all that and what they're trying to achieve. But there are tractors out there that have um, a vast amount of horsepower compared to a lot of the tractors that you see in common day. But So here's a, here's a photo of the new shop. Um, the new shop was built, the new test lab, um, which is uh, Splinter Labs. Um, it is located directly north of the test track and uh, northwest of our facility. It's kind of basically our little campus area within East Campus. And uh, it was built um, in the 70s, I believe, basically because the tractors started getting so big. Um, our museum has a large door on the north side, and basically once the tractors couldn't fit through that door anymore, they had to figure out something else. And so they decided to build a, uh, a large um, building that also, uh, it also houses a machine shop that's used by the department um, that can build virtually anything uh, anyone would need. Um, they also house the uh, University of Nebraska quarter scale team and uh, a few other classrooms and things as well. But the test lab uh, on the west end is the, uh, the major draw for, uh, for this particular building. But you can see that it, um, the tractor basically is hooked up to the, the PTO dyno, and there's also engineers that sit behind a, a glass wall that monitor all the, uh, uh, all the telemetry and things um, to keep the, the tractors uh, going. They'll be on the dyno also for about six or eight hours, um, depending on what, uh, what the, the current configuration is for the, for the test. Um, they only do testing when the ambient temperature is between 40 degrees and 80 degrees. And this particular facility is not air conditioned. It is heated, so you can test in the wintertime, but there were several times this summer um, when it was so hot that they would come in in the, uh, you know, at 10 o'clock and fire up the tractor, let it get warmed up, and then start the test at about 2 o'clock and let it run till 6, and that was the test. So it just depends on um, how many tractors are scheduled, how backed up they are, they need to get these tests done. Um, generally, the testing season starts in the fall and runs through till November-ish, depending on snow. Um, we don't test in the snow for obvious reasons, um, traction and, and all those considerations. But um, they also then uh, test in the early spring. Uh, last year, since we had a fairly soft winter, they were able to test um, for quite a while and get quite a few tractors done. Um, then they usually run through till May-ish and then start back up um, in late July, early August. So um, they're not quite testing year-round, but they do get quite a few tests in. I think there was about uh, almost 30 tractors scheduled to be tested this year um, for various models. They usually do one manufacturer at a time so that they only have um, their engineers there at a time, and then they switch out so they don't have to constantly go back and forth. But um, 
in any event, this is our, uh, as I mentioned, this is our current facility that we have. Um, I thought this was an interesting photo. A lot of people get a kick out of this. This is uh, at uh, where our museum is now, at the original lab. This was an indoor drawbar test that they tried to do. I'm assuming um, so that they didn't have to use the test track, um, so it could be a more confined um, test. Uh, for simple reasons, it just did not work. It, it couldn't replicate the exact numbers that they were looking for with um, doing the actual testing out on the track. And also at this time, I mean, they, they built it after the building was built. Ideally, you'd have a pit and be able to just roll it right up onto there, but getting the tractor itself up onto the, the treadmill was, was kind of a tricky <coughs> task um, as well. So um, they scrapped this pretty early on. And uh, if you think about today, what we'd have to do for some of those huge tractors to do something like that, it just wouldn't be feasible. Um, it would be very interesting, but it just wouldn't simply take the place of the drawbar tests that they do today out on the track. Uh, so getting back to the track a little bit, um, our track is located on East Campus. It was originally dirt, and in 1956 it was paved uh, for the first time. And it has been uh, repaved to what it is now, basically to accommodate the wider tractors. Um, at the time it was originally paved, it was only about 10 foot wide, which as the tractors got bigger and bigger, it became harder and harder to keep the entire tractor um, on the track at all times. So um, it's 100% um, level end to end, and the tractor, or the track is a half mile long. And uh, I always get questions at the museum when people are looking out the windows at our track um, well, why is it that long? And there's a simple answer for that. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the building uh, that we are currently in is located at the east end of the track. 33rd Street as at the west end of the track. So they basically just had a half mile worth of room um, in order to build the track. Uh, we don't necessarily need a half mile. They only test, um, they only take data from about the middle 500 feet on both the front stretch and the back stretch in order to keep it consistent. So they're not um, doing any testing in the turns or anything like that specifically, um, though the data is being recorded um, that doesn't actually go into the test. So um, there's sometimes there's less scientific answers for, for questions like that, but um, it is a half mile in length. And um, Splinter Labs, as I mentioned, houses the, the current dyno, and they test uh, between 40 and 80 degrees. Um, this is an aerial shot. I believe this was taken in the 50s, um, probably shortly after they had paved the, uh, the track. Um, from the... Uh, from the aerial view, this area here, which at this time was all chicken coops and used by um, other ag departments for livestock and things, um, that area is where Splinter Labs is located um, currently. And of course the museum is located right here. The parking lot's still there. And um, basically uh, this is Chase Hall here and um, Ag Mall runs um, to the uh, to the south there. Um, currently, there are several buildings. This turn is still here. This is um, this is Thirty Fifth Street and this is Fair Street. Uh, currently, there's a, a, a child development laboratory on that corner, and then there's also a couple other buildings um, that were there too. The, the larger building there, um, I'm not sh I can't remember the name of it, but that's where the East Campus Rec Center is now that's currently being renovated, so. Mm -hmm. Is that a half mile long from curve to curve? It, half mile Around. in total, yeah, in circumference, half mile in circumference. Good question. Um, and then 33rd Street is located at the bottom there, so. It was very common when they did tests that they would have a field, uh, a test day where they would invite dealers and uh, manufacturers and uh, farmers, um, anybody who wanted to come out and watch, they would put on demonstrations. And I'm not 
quite sure when that stopped happening, but we have several photos from uh, really up through the 60s of these large events that they had, probably in conjunction with something else on East Campus as well um, to kind of draw in the crowd. But um, they would basically just have everybody line up and they would do you know, a parade of tractors and have uh, testing, go over the, the, what they're testing for, inform farmers of um, different manufacturers and different uh, products that were out there as well as uh, uh, you know, all the performance of, of these different vehicles. You'll also note in this photo, as I mentioned earlier, that they had a dirt track around the exterior of the cement track or the concrete track. And um, that's basically what this is here, and that's, that's where they would run all the, all the tracked vehicles with the steel tracks. Um, one of the downfalls to the dirt tracks, not only do you have to um, be aware of your weather conditions and whatnot, I mean, if it rains, then you're just sitting there waiting for it to dry out, basically. But in order to keep the tests consistent, that's when they decided to, to pave the track. Um, because dirt consistency for anybody that's been around not only farms but uh, horse racing and automotive racing, um, dirt's very hard to replicate consistently to keep that, that consistent um, product uh, in order to test all the tractors on the same um, playing field. So, uh, you know, if, if, if one tractor is, goes out when the dirt's a little bit tacky, they're going to get uh, much different readings than when the track's completely dirt and, uh, and dry and dusty. So um, it's basically just a consistency issue that the uh, the concrete track is is more consistent, and that's why we um, that's why we do it. And also, if it does rain, it usually dries out relatively quickly, so that um, they can get back out and uh, and do some some tests. They won't test in the rain for the same reason they don't test in the snow. Um, traction is always an issue, and you always have a little bit of wheel slip. Um, generated through these types of testings anytime you're pulling. That's why we have the wheel counters on the wheels themselves. But um, for the most part, uh, when it's dry, everything's fairly consistent. What about tires? Tires would make a big difference. If you put a, a tractor tire or a turf tire on the tractor, mm -hmm. Uh, generally, um, most of the tractors have similar tires on them when they're being tested. Most new tractors, they'll come out and they will uh, they'll run around the track, uh, maybe for a day, a uh, few, few revolutions at a time, just to kind of knock off that fresh rubber um, to kind of cut down on wheel slip because, um, I mean, even your automotive tires and everything, they kind of have a, a little bit of a... Uh, you know where they get sealed over a little bit so you want to get that off in order to get down to your good traction but yeah you're you're absolutely right each tire would probably have a little bit different but by today's standards most of the tires are very similar um, as long as they run the same tread pattern uh, which from what I've experienced all of them have so um, that that would be an issue as well um, I do want to uh, kind of backtrack he brings up a good point with tires um, steel wheels were very common on uh, tractors all the way through the 40s, basically. But in, uh, in the early, th early to mid-30s, most of the tire companies started coming out with tractor tires. And some of them were reliable, some of them weren't. But the ones that were reliable, um, it was always asked by the uh, uh, farmers what's better? Is steel better than the rubber tires? Or is this rubber tire just a fad? Or, you know, what, what's, all, what's all that about? So in 1933, the University of Nebraska's test lab and the Agricultural Engineering Department put out a comprehensive uh, study uh, of steel wheels versus rubber tires. And basically, um, in, in, uh, just to kind of give some background on the testing, they provided, I believe it was 24 different tests over the course of probably a year um, because they had different uh, types of tests that they did. What they did was they provided two tractors that were identically prepared, one with steel wheels and one with rubber tires, and they would go out to a farm and they would plow the field, um, and then they would take studies from that. They would go out and they would um, 
you know, mow a prairie and each tractor would do that. They would harvest corn and they would, they would go through that. They would pull the same implements each time. And basically how they determined which was better was they, over the course of, of time, uh, throughout doing the, the job, they would calculate how much ground was covered and then also how much fuel was consumed. And those were kind of the two main parts of the study. Basically, in all of the studies that were done, rubber tires outperformed the steel wheels um, almost every time uh, in both uh, performance and in fuel uh, consumption. Um, now, tire inflation, just like on today's vehicles, is always uh, a, a varying um, part of that as well, but all of them were, were kept the same. So that was uh, one of the major tests, but it still wasn't until the, the mid-40s that they all kind of started switching over to, to rubber wheels. But in our collection, we have two um, Alice Chalmers tractors. One is the Alice WC and one is the Alice U, and both of those tractors were the very first tractors to be certified on both uh, steel wheels and rubber tires, so you could um, you could Alice could sell them either way, and you could purchase them either way depending on what you um, what you wanted to do. Now, as an obvious point, all the farmers that used rubber tires in the tests said that the tractors were easier to handle and they rode a lot better than the steel wheels. Um, but that's just you know a product of rubber tires versus you know solid steel wheels. If you had solid rubber tires, they would probably perform similar to the, to the steel wheels as well. Um, a little background on Lester Larson. Um, the museum is, is named for Lester Larson and uh, Lester was basically instrumental in, um, he was instrumental in collecting all of the artifacts and tractors that represented certain eras that we have in our collection today. And he was the chief engineer um, from uh, 1946 to 1975, and it was officially named after him in 1998. He uh, also worked extensively in the Department of Agriculture as well. Our, uh, our collection, I didn't want to put too many pictures in here of our collection because I want you all to come out and, uh, and see the collection for yourself. Um, but we do have um, almost 30, 30 vintage tractors. We're constantly upgrading our exhibits, and we have several uh, antique implements and hand tools as well uh, on display. Uh, one of the tractors I did want to point out, mostly because it's a very interesting tractor, is uh, this Hyder C. It's a 1220. And going back to what I mentioned earlier about the Waterloo Boy, it basically is uh, um, rated at 12 horsepower on the drawbar and 20 horsepower on the belt. But this particular tractor, which was test number 16, which would have still been done in 1920, um, has a very unique engine configuration and drive component to it. In order to shift speeds, um, the entire engine slides forwards and backwards. There's a friction drive wheel, uh, very similar to what we have in our, uh, our riding lawnmowers and things today, that you have your, your friction drive wheel and then you have on the back of the, the uh, engine, um, on, your, um, uh, on your engine you have a friction wheel. And that wheel rubs up against your drive wheel. And depending on if your engine is all the way forward and running on the outside of that drive wheel, uh, you'll go different speeds than if it's on the inside of the drive wheel. And so that's, that's basically was the transmission. Um, now that thing would have to be greased a considerable amount, I'm sure, in order to keep it um, active so you could slide it forward and backward. But you're basically just operating a lever, so you had to be pretty strong, too, in order to slide that huge engine forward and backwards. But um, it's a very unique configuration, um, and that's, that's one of the the tractors that you'll see in our collection. We also have um, a, uh, a Ford tractor similar to what was purchased by Crozier, and we also have an oil pole that represents the oil pole that, uh, that Crozier purchased as well. So we have kind of the, the keystones. We also have a, uh, a, a Waterloo boy similar to the one that was uh, the first certified in 1920. Just a few uh, upcoming uh, uh, things for the museum itself. Um, we're working on building improvements. We are um, not funded by the university whatsoever. They provide us um, the building and that's um, and a few resources, but most of our funding comes from donors and, um, and 
exhibit donations and things like that. So we're looking at uh, putting in a new gift shop and a new museum entrance, which will be on the north side. Um, those are all interior. We're not actually adding on to the building at all. Um, we're also going to be adding a small collections gallery and uh, renovating a, a space for our new um, art gallery as well for traveling exhibits and things like that. So um, then we're also putting in new windows. I just threw that up there because, as I mentioned, the, the building was built in 1920 and we have um, basically about 1920s vintage windows. Um, so anybody that knows, especially out there today with 30 mile an hour winds, it gets fairly breezy in, in parts of the museum. So those are all new things that we're doing. Um, we're working on new exhibits um, for our Model T in the collection as well as our Ford Sun. Our steel wheels versus rubber tires going over the study that I uh, had mentioned earlier. And then we're also putting together a wall of tractor testing VIPs, which are all the people that date back to 1920. There's about six of them that we've handpicked that are, were key individuals in getting the tractor testing not only started, but able to keep that testing um, sustained throughout the years uh, at the uh, university. And I threw in a, just a neat photo. I was going through the photos this morning, putting some photos in here, and I came across this photo. There's actually three or four of them, but um, I, I don't know who these women are exactly. But um, some of the subs subsequent photos to this, they were basically being trained on, on how to drive the tractor and, and everything by some of the chief engineers at the, uh, at the test lab. So um, they were out for a field day and, and having a blast on this uh, farm all tractor. Um, but uh, anyway, I just thought that was a neat photo, so I threw that on there. Um, the the uh, last slide here, um, I just wanted to mention the museum again. We're located on East Campus and uh, at roughly 35th and Fair, um, directly north of Chase Hall, and the parking lot is directly there as well. We're in walking distance from the dairy store and the textile gallery that's on East Campus as well. So if you make a trip to East Campus, please stop by. Our museum hours are Tuesday through Friday, 9 to 4, and we're open on Saturdays uh, from 12 to 2. And um, our museum website is tractormuseum.unl.edu, and our phone number is there as well. But uh, definitely make sure to come out and stop by and see us. And I guarantee you, if you come by in the next few months and you come back next spring, it'll be completely different. So um, definitely want you to stop by and, uh, and take a look at what we have. You'll also get a tour of the test facility as well, which, uh, as I mentioned, with uh, the testing going on um, this season, you'll be able to go out and see some tests, on, not only on the track, but also on the dyno in the test lab as well. Um, with that, are there any additional questions that maybe I didn't address or things that came up? Yes. First thing is, I've been there. <laughs> I don't know anything about tractors. <laughs> um, but it is fascinating. I've taken little grandkids, and they absolutely love it. It's just so many eye things to look at. Mm -hmm. But my question is, is because Nebraska has this license, this uh, certification mm -hmm. law, testing law, does that affect all tractor sales in the whole U.S., or is it only if people try to sell the tractor in Nebraska? Well, the certification itself is only for Nebraska. But I will tell you that since we're a premier test facility, that any tractor sold throughout the United States, the manufacturers are using that data to promote their tractors, whether it's fuel efficiency. And if you put on there that this is certified from the University of Nebraska's test facility, then that comes with the peace of mind that you're getting a product that is tried and true, not only from the manufacturer itself. I mean, if you're buying from a reputable manufacturer like John Deere, Case, Agco, any of these um, tractor manufacturers that have been around, New Holland, any of those, um, you'll, you'll be getting that. But by having it said that that is certified by the state of Nebraska's test facility, that is a big part of, of selling tractors. Um, Going back to the when the tractor law was originally passed, there were other states um, around Nebraska and, and throughout the Midwest that tried that saw what Nebraska did and tried to get that passed. But since they uh, didn't have the personnel, they they maybe didn't have as much interest in the legislature at the time to get that passed. Um, we all know in order to get a law passed, you got to have funding and, and enough people wanting it to get it pushed through in order to get it passed, that they just didn't get, um, 
get that done. Um, but basically, the certification works for the state of Nebraska, and you can take that certification to um, other states as well. Right. Let me just follow up. Uh -huh. do, any, do any major manufacturers simply avoid Nebraska with major models that they sell elsewhere um, and don't come here? Not necessarily. Your, your major manufacturers know that agricultural um, importance in Nebraska is a huge part of their market. And so most of your manufacturers aren't going to do that. Now, there are smaller manufacturers that maybe manufacture tractors that you won't necessarily use out in your field, but you might use on your log, uh, livestock you know, farm, that sort of thing, where you're just pulling around grain carts and stuff like that, where you're not doing a, a whole bunch of tremendous work. Um, that might not be selling here. I know that, that there's several dealers that, um, new dealers, you know, there's dealers from Europe and, and dealers from overseas that might be putting out tractors that are similar, but yeah, they, they don't quite understand necessarily Nebraska's test law, and so they won't bring their tractors here to be certified. And we've actually, um, we're actually putting out um, promotions and going to different, um, different dealer shows and associations and trying to get that, that word out because the Nebraska dealers want those tractors to come and be sold in the state of Nebraska because there's a market here for that. But some of the manufacturers just don't understand how to, what the process is. And we don't set people up to fail. That's not what, our, our, what Nebraska is all about for the test lab. Um, and in fact, they have to provide an engineer that is here every day with the testing that not only goes over the data, but they also drive the tractors being tested too. So there's no finger pointing um, later on that, you know, oh, well, you know, you didn't drive it correctly or it wasn't set up properly. And for the most part, almost all the, the manufacturers that bring their tractors here are satisfied with what we do and they're, they're satisfied with their product as well. Mm -hmm. uh, find the difference between large, medium, and small. <laughs> Obviously, there's, there's six eight-wheel tractors. Yeah. There's a normal tractor and you know, there's a smaller tractor and mm -hmm. a lawn tractor. Yeah. Obviously, you don't do the lawn tractor. Uh, no, I believe the cutoff is right around 80 horsepower. Anything lower than 80 horsepower doesn't have to be. It's in a separate class, so it's not certified um, as, as such. I'm not 100% sure on that, but I know there's a, a lower cutoff. Um, but then everything else is basically your, your medium range goes from about where that, that cutoff is to about... 200 horsepower, 250 horsepower. Anything beyond that is generally considered a large tractor. Um, I'd have to look up the statistics on some of this early, some of these huge tractors, but I've, I've been told that, that their horsepower is rated um, over what it really needs to be in order to perform in the field. You're, you're not gonna, in today's standards, you see 24, 36 row planters um, anything larger than that simply isn't going to be applicable, you know, around here. So, so you don't test 80, 80 horsepower below, you don't test? Generally, yeah, yeah, generally. Now, there have been, on a side note, there have been instances where somebody wanted to import a small tractor. Maybe it wouldn't fit into that, but they wanted to import it. And so before being sold, even anywhere in the United States, they would bring that tractor to the test facility to make sure that it was a good investment. And we have one Chinese tractor on display in the museum from the 80s that is an example of that, that the gentleman wanted to import it. He brought it to the, brought one of them to the test facility, and it was awful. Um, it didn't perform at all. It wasn't manufactured correctly and everything. And so he decided not to go down that venture. So that was a very smart individual that saved not only himself, but a lot of people a lot of money by doing that, and there's still some people that can do that today, so. Mm -hmm. What is the testing cost to manufacture? That I'm not sure 100% on. I know it's, it's, it's not relatively cheap by our standards, but by the manufacturer's standards, um, it's relatively inexpensive for them. And if it's kind of a safeguarding against um, certain things too, um, then that helps. Uh, but for the most part, um, they generally put a down payment down in order to lock themselves in, and then um, they usually pay after that. So, All right, well, thank you, guys. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Definitely um, come out and come by the Larson uh, Tractor Museum on East Campus.
and um, we hope to see you around. Thank you.